Paul. So I see in the show notes our very first topic is visiting a chip fab. I'm so excited. I wish I was going on this. I wish I'd gone on this trip with you. Tell me about visiting a chip fab. Okay, so so uh, for context, if you're listening to this and not looking at images, there is uh, a picture of not a potato chip factory or anything of the kind, uh, but actually a silicon foundry, a uh, place where they oh. etch silicon wafers. Oh, that's not that's not nearly as cool. So you didn't get I like figured any I'd free put bags the image in chips. there for you. Yeah, no, there's <laughs> no lays. No Doritos involved. There's actually no Doritos like allowed anywhere in the facility. It's weird. I don't know why. Joking aside, I am serious. This picture looks like 2001: A Space Odyssey. They've got these dome, ref these reflective domes on the wall that let you. S I see those sorts of things alongside of the road. It's like a reflective mirror, so you can keep. So you can see traffic coming around a tricky bend. But yeah. I've never seen one indoors, and I can't imagine what it's for. But it makes the thing look even more like Hal, or like a Hal family reunion. <laughs> yeah, it was it was kind of a surreal experience. You get into okay, so this is a this is a class one hundred clean room. It's an ISO five, I think. Um and so you can't just like walk in there. You can't, you know, prop the front door open or whatever. Uh, you have to put on a full body suit. You have to put on gloves before you can even touch the gloves that you have to wear in, in the, the room. Wow. Do they make you put your cigarette out? Yeah, uh, no pets. Um, like I said, no potato chips. Um, it, it's kind of interesting because in the facility there's there's two different classes. There's a class 100, which is most of it, and this is this is not like a room. The, the picture there is like a, a hallway, but there's like miles of this stuff. Like it's a huge, huge place. Uh, and so anyway, you you can't um, you can't go in there with anything you know that's going to create dust or anything like that. But then there's also a class 10 clean room, like inside, in, in uh, various places. And in there, if you walk in there when you're not authorized, they'll be able to detect you just from the evaporation of your sweat into the air. Wow. Do they have, do they have auto guns mounted in the wall that just cut you down instantly as soon as they detect <laughs> no, a hint of that human would produce, sweat? That would produce gunpowder, <laughs> Seamus. It's completely unacceptable. <laughs> right. And blood splatter, right. that, like, you can't do that. Right, they'd have to drop you down like a hole into like something yeah, yeah. and then through an airlock and then just into like a big meat grinder. There is a, a sub fab. So there's the fab level and then there's like this perforated floor and then there's the sub fab where all the pipes and caustic chemicals and stuff are. Oh, so they could just they could just dunk you into the chemicals. Just a dunk tank. Yeah, as soon yeah. as as soon as your your human sweat touches the air, boop, down and there you go. Well, probably the best way to do it would just be to purge the whole area with nitrogen and get rid of the oxygen. You you know pass out and no mess. Right. Right. There seriously so, are warnings on the walls though about like warning nitrogen purge area do not enter things like that. That is so crazy. Like you see this stuff in video games and you're like, what is this a real thing? Does this happen? Do we have stuff that does this? That is, it's cool that it really exists. I, I will put pictures of this in the show notes because it's a really cool place. And what you don't see in the picture is that there's those, if you look up near the ceiling, there's kind of like boxes, kind of box looking things. And there's like a rail, there's rails up there. Those are actually little robots that run around like on the tracks hanging from the ceiling. <gasps> Too cool. Yeah. And then they, they've got little arms that they're kind of like, um, claw machine kind of things only they're you know fancy whatever they come down and grab things and pull them up to the ceiling and then run around somewhere else and drop them down to another machine so it's it's all just troublesome it's totally out of science bags. fiction yeah troublesome flesh bags that get out of line if Need only man you have to walk everywhere in there if you could get a <laughs> robot to carry you around that'd be fantastic so tell me about your vid like what were you here for 
Uh, the company I work for makes and, and supports some equipment that they need to install, and so I was there helping with the install. Friend computer didn't give you any trouble? <laughs> well, we did have some trouble getting in. There was uh, some mix-up on our, our passes, and so we had to wait for a while on the first day, but we got it straightened out eventually. Eventually we were able to, to get in there. It's actually kind of kind of sparse. Most of the time, there's a lot of people in there working, but because of the the pandemic stuff, most people are just working from home, and uh, so it was it was pretty empty. It was even more kind of science fictiony surreal. Oh, and then the other no thing is those those yeah. yellow lights. It's not just a color grading. Like the the whole facility really is that kind of bright yellow color because the blue light will expose um, the photoresist on the the wafers. And so you can't have any anything close to white light. It's all going to be like, you know, yellow and red. Huh. So these parts of the picture that are blown out to white, that's probably just an artifact of the photography and not true to the picture. Well, I mean, it looks it looks white because I mean, when all the light is yellow, then of course you know, your eyes just kind of adjust and, and rebalance it. But right, right. yeah, it is it is all yellow in there. That is a cool place to get to visit. Yeah. I'm going back uh, for two weeks. This this recent one was just a couple days, and then there's going to be an install in a few weeks that's going to last for a couple weeks. So uh, some of the diecast will come to you from, where is that, Albuquerque. That is very cool. So I told my wife when I got home, Man, I found this great place. Like this is the this is where I want to live. Like it's so clean and everything is just the right place and there's robots <laughs> yeah. everywhere. And she's like, "Yeah, but like they, you can't have kids in there." I was like, "Yeah, I know, but it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make." <laughs> it's a sacrifice you're going to have to make according to the computer. <laughs> That's right. The computer requires your sacrifice. Wow, that's cool. The, all these pictures are cool. The, I, I'll have a link to this in the show notes. It links to a bunch of photographs. So go to town. What a good, what a cool place to visit. And just to be clear, the, the pictures there are just like Google search chip fab. And the one that I linked is of the actual facility that I was at. But they're all kind of similar. So yeah, it's right. representative. All right. So. Um, some good news. I Good Robot is now open source. For those that remember my the video game I worked on years ago, it is open source. So you can download the source and mod the hell out of it and go to town. Nice. I know people were asking at the time, like, why didn't you release this open source? And you're like, I was paid to do this and this isn't my choice. So it's cool to hear that right. it's, it's open available now. Right. I thought, oh, I'm not going to ask Arvind to, you know, make it open source. That would be such a dick move. We, you know, we came together, we made this money, and just, hey, Arvind, most people are not okay, okay with open source. But then Arvind came to me and suggested it. And I was like, yes, yes. He's like, would you be open to it? And I'm like, yeah, let's do it, man. And I will link to the GitHub repository. Um... And just anybody that wants can take a look at it. If you have any questions about it, I mean, you're probably going to, if you're a coder, you can go through and hunt down all my mistakes and point at me and laugh at me. Um, th this makes me yeah, super nervous. Be what? I was going to say, it is hard to put your code on, on the internet, especially when it's something complicated where it's like, I know this isn't perfect. Right, like... I mean, I was already worried when we launched, like, what am I forgetting? What did I miss? What did I do wrong? What could I have done better? And now, now we're going to find out. If anybody looks at it, you know, they'll, <laughs> they'll probably spot my, my sins. But, you know, that's how you make software better. I mean, you got to do that. you got to open yourself yeah, up yeah. to embarrassment and criticism because that's how you make stuff better. Um, I really love open source, so I'm glad people are going to get to see this. If anybody still cares about the game, um, yeah, it'll be out there. If so anybody, I know that a lot of open source projects have like dependency hell, where 
sure, you have access to the source code, but it depends on all these other projects that may or may not be up to date or may not have the version that it was built based on available. Is this all packaged in one thing, or do we need to go on a scavenger hunt to find all the things to make it work and actually compile? I hope that this should... I have not downloaded it myself, which I should have done that. Hopefully, this should be the full repository. Actually, looking at the repository now, I can see SDL2, OpenAL, FreeType. Yeah, it looks like it's all in there. I know I can't. I can't promise that to anybody. And this, you know, is like most, like most open source. There, there is no support for this. You're on your own. But Godspeed and good luck if you if you dive in. If anybody wants to actually play... Now, of course, you won't have the art assets. That is not open source. It's, you know, you, you'll need to get a copy of the game or make all your own art assets. You could do that too. But if anybody, if anybody's a coder and they really want to check this out, um, I have some Steam keys left. You can just send an email to the diecast and I will, you know, if you're a coder, you want to look at it, um, send an email to the diecast. The email is diecast at shamusyoung.com and I will send you back a Steam key as long as I've got some left. I can't make a promise. I don't know how fast these will go, if anybody will want one, but I can send out Steam keys and then you'll have a copy of the game and then you can compile the game and, you know, take the executable you made, plot, you know, with all your changes and put it into the game directory and play modded, um, good robot very cool i'm looking forward to the community project where we turn this into like an xcom kind of thing where you've got a whole second base building thing that happens in between missions it'll be great i think the game desperately needs a crafting system and loot boxes <laughs> loot boxes <laughs> Uh, like if we'd made it a few years later we probably would have made the random gun drops be a piss take on loot boxes that was the mindset we were in you know yeah had, yeah you've got the hats thing in there right we were we were even then even when we made the game the hats reference making fun of hats in games was a little dated but now it's a very dated reference but yeah the, today we would have done that with loot some sort of just within the game there is an actual loot box that you open and it would act like loot boxes that you buy but of course they would just be for in-game money or or guns or whatever and that would totally make sense because oh, right, they do yeah. drop random guns yeah oh fun yeah it was kind of interesting that it was like a almost like a parody of a video game right right it is uh, it is interesting how it turned out. There are a lot of ideas in there that never occurred to me, but then the version I had was not interesting enough, and that's you know that's why I teamed up with the rest of the team. One because I needed Arvin's help to like finish it, because the things it needed were all things that I didn't want to do. Right, and he'd done and had expertise with, and you know was good at, and. Uh, and the other thing is I don't, you know, didn't know what other systems do we need? Well, what's the spark this thing needs? And the team had a lot of ideas. And so by working together, it was much more than what I made by myself. That was a really positive experience working with those folks. That was really great. Now, half the team is at Ubisoft. Really? Yeah, different project. They didn't like go together. These are different people from different countries. Both wound up at Ubisoft. That is, that's really cool. I had kind of wondered what happened after Good Robot because it kind of, it didn't do well. And then uh, I was like, well, is this over? Like, did all these guys are they living under a bridge now? What happened? But uh, it's good to hear they're still in the games industry. Ross is working on. Watch Dogs Legion, which is still one of my most anticipated games of 2020, and it has nothing to do with the fact that Ross worked on it. Uh, Arvin didn't tell me what he's working on, so I assume it's still under wraps. But Ross is working on, or worked on, I don't know, maybe it's possible Watch Dogs Legion is, has been finished and they're waiting to release or something. 
you know, because of COVID, a bunch of release schedules got all messed up and nobody's sure what they're doing. So I don't know where that's at, but I'm hoping I get to see it here in 2020. Very good. Yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, excellent. In fact, Ross, the mission he devised, or some mission concept he devised as part of the team, wound up being the one that got showed off at E3. Really? Yeah, yeah. E3 so he's doing or, like level design, or uh, I'm not sure what all work he did. He was the art. He was like the. Um, pixel art artist for the for the team and he did also he did the, the number of, oh pixel art and game balance and like he the when you get the source for good robot you'll see a lot of the game mechanics are in just a text file defining all the guns in the game and what they do and what their damage values are and how they work and that was all him. He's that that file was his baby. And like the core mechanics of the game are in that file. And he spent a lot of time. He's probably played more good robot than any other human being on Earth. Because, you know, so, he balanced all his weapons. And so you were basically the engine designer and he was the game designer. That's very true. You know, I was the game designer to begin with when I was alone, but I was happy to offload a lot all that to the team or at least to you know just make myself an equal like we all have a say in this and my say isn't any more important than anybody else's and ross had the most to say on it um and i was cool. happy to just let those guys run with it because you know the the engine stuff is what i cared about is like can we can we handle more can we handle more particles how many robots can we have can we have more because there should be no limit on today's computers, you should be able to fight 10,000 safely. And on my computer, you know, it, it ran pretty good, but I was always shy of, you know, there's always that edge case, that one person that has something I didn't think about, and the game drops the one frame a second. <laughs> right. So, so, I would like to have pushed that higher, but, you know, it didn't necessarily make any gameplay sense. You know, what's the value in fighting 100 or 200 robots over the 20 you normally fight? Like, there's no gameplay reason to do it. I just wanted, uh, I just wanted a game engine that would handle huge numbers of dynamic objects, because that was fun. Right, right, it's a challenge. Right. I still wouldn't mind, like, taking another swing at that, but... Considering how poorly the first one sold, um, doing another one would be unwise. But, like, I love the idea of, like, just how far could I push this? How much dynamic crap could I get into this engine? Well, you know, there's an open source project. You could probably just contribute to it. <laughs> right. Let's just go anonymous and start contributing crap to it. Oh, well. Oh, well. Uh, other people can now look at it and see what's going yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. The kids still play good robot occasionally, so I'll, I'll let them know. Maybe they'll be, get interested in programming and do some uh, some good robot mods. Cool. So here's another topic from you. This is the, one of the most mysterious bullet points I've ever seen in our show notes. Explain yourself, Paul. What's going on here? So I was watching a, it wasn't really a documentary, it was like a short film kind of thing about Werner Herzog and his inspiration. He's an art, uh, artistic film director. And uh, a lot of his characters, according to this, I've never, I don't think I've ever watched a Werner Herzog film myself, but I was watching this film about him and about his films. And the person who made this film said that his characters are always characters that are not capable of communicating sufficiently through language like that they're that they're in either um, physically incapable of communicating through language or psychologically or the things that they're trying to communicate are too complex or too visual in order to sufficiently be able to express themselves through language and uh and that's one of the reasons that, according to this person, he's so successful as a film director is because his characters demand the medium of film. 
they couldn't be sufficiently expressed in a book because language itself isn't sufficient to express them. Okay, so I haven't seen any Werner Herzog movies either, except one. And I had to look it up, and I'd totally forgotten the, the title of it. It was Lo and Behold, Reveries of the Connected World. It was about... I hope, I hope this is the right one. I'm looking this up on Wikipedia now. But whatever it was, it was this fascinating look at the internet from, like, the first days in 1960 when, you know, two people had two different computers connecting over a phone line and they were talking over a packet switch network. You know, it, but it was just two computers. And, right. And going from that to like the internet of things and it, it's not a very technical movie in fact it's incredibly i was actually frustrated by the lack of technical information it was all this is all for the absolute lay person just sort of the, instead of explaining what happened this is more like walking through a museum of what happened look here is this interesting thing about the internet. And, oh, look, here are these people that had this thing to do. Um, yeah. It was very, very an interesting movie and unlike other documentaries I've seen. Um, yeah, but... Uh, and other than and that... It had a lot to do about... It, but it had a lot to do about the the experience of communicating in this in this medium, right? Right. The only other times I'm familiar with Werner Herzog is from the Jack Reacher movie, which I watched for. Don't ask. I have no idea why I watched that. And The Mandalorian, <laughs> which everybody should watch. Everybody that likes Star Wars, because he's good in that. Anyway, so he is a fascinating, you know, writer, director, fiction. He does fiction. He does documentaries. He does writing. He does television. He does movies. And he sometimes acts. Like, holy cow, this guy's all over the place. Yeah. The very, oh, and he's an opera the, director. Quixotic. Yeah, yeah. He's a quixotic figure. Yeah. So I was watching this thing. It, and it, it got me thinking about, like, this is a man who knows the medium that he's working in, and he's not interested in wasting any time on characters that could be better expressed elsewhere. Like, he's he's going to grab on to just the things that demand his skills, you know, the cinema. The characters that demand right. expression through the cinema. And that got me thinking, right. okay, what characters demand expression through games? Like, what what characters, what situations, what things are only experienceable through the medium oh. of, of games? No, I see. What things you can't you get anywhere else? And and like that that kind of fascinated me. I was like, man, this because if you can figure that out, then you could really make a game that couldn't be anything else. Because we complain about, oh, well, these games are trying to be movies. And it's like, well. Yeah, but like maybe the idea that they're trying to express would be better expressed by a movie. So you can't really complain that they're kind of like a movie because like, well, you know, that's the best way of expressing those ideas. But then it's like, okay, well, why don't we just make games that are only games that that are trying to do the things that only games can do. And that reminded me of uh, Jonathan Blow's thing. Uh, he made a video about um, education and how games there are some things that games are better at than any, anything else um and i watched that too yes that was very interesting. yeah yeah about learning and how how it can express things that if you had to describe it to someone or had to show it to someone it would take a very long time but if you let someone play with it they can gain an intuitive understanding much much more quickly maybe not impossible to do it in other mediums but it's so much more effective when it's in a game Right, right, and he was almost like people kept demanding. Um, except, well, give us some examples if you think games. And he was like, "This is why I started the conversation." Like, I think this is obviously true, and I think we should all start thinking about this. There are clearly ideas that are much more comprehensible when you interact with them. 
even even things like a spreadsheet how many how many things are instantly obvious once you interact with them in some sort of spreadsheet in graph form where if i described the interaction if you make this number go up this number right here will change like that's that's hard to especially when you're talking about stuff like economics it's very hard to picture it's very hard to you know integrate but then you see it on a graph and you're like oh that makes total sense yeah right yeah so the the character that leapt to mind to me if it were talking just about characters was uh was shodan or or like it's you know some sort of malevolent ai because it's very hard to picture that right like You've got a space station. Well, it's still a space station. There's nothing wrong with a space station intrinsically. It's just the space station is behaving. It's reacting to you in a way that is malevolent. And like, how do you make a film about that? Well, you could have a film of someone trying a bunch of different things and getting these malevolent reactions, but it's much more visceral. It's much more understandable if you're the person trying it. And and that uh, that kind of thing, I think, is, is kind of the core of... Uh, of what games are, or at least that's yeah. how I got there from Werner Herzog. Yeah, you know, the, especially the Shodan one, which is really good. Like, if that was a movie, doing all the things, like the audience is going to be sitting there, well, why didn't he just, you know, pull the, pull, why didn't you just do this? Why didn't you just do that? And it's like, it's a video game. Go right ahead. Like, try as many things as you think you can. Now, of course, you have to be limited by the things provided by the game designer. But, yeah, you can just try those things, even if they would that wouldn't make for good cinema to show the main character methodically trying these different combinations of things. But in a video game, you knock yourself out. It's your own time right, that you're wasting. Right. You might as well lay down and die and let Shodan have you, but if you want to keep fighting, go ahead, I guess. Yeah. Uh, my, uh, the one that leaped to mind when you described it, and I realized it's basically the same answer. My answer would be Durandal from the Marathon series, which I've never played, but I just watched, um, I just watched Chris Franklin's Errant Signal video about the marathon games and Durndal is very different from Shodan uh, but is an equally interesting figure in video games and it is is very similar idea in that you only uh, Durndal was on text only text on a screen that was it's only communication with you. You'd walk up to a screen and it would have some, um, you know, something to say to you in green text on a black screen. Um, and then, you know, you'd go, sh then you'd go shoot things for forever <laughs> and get to the next screen. But it was very, very interesting character, you know, a character with gold. It's not just trying to murder all the meatbag humans. I, I think based on uh, Chris's video, I think based on his summary, Durandal sounds like a more interesting adversary than Shodan. Um, mm. And I mean, I'm a huge fan. I fictionalized the entire System Shock game, so I'm a huge Shodan fan. Um, in as in as much as you can be a fan of a being that wants to annihilate humanity, but um, but yeah, Durandal sounds like a more interesting character. That would be another one. Like if you did Durandal any other way, it would not be as it would lose something. Right. Even giving it a voice would might be there's an ambiguity to reading that text. If you if you gave up, if you went to novels, then you're just, you, you give up the interactivity and the sense of being there and being surrounded by Durandal. <laughs> but if you, um, but if you go, yeah, but if you make a movie, then you, then you lose all the things that you get from it being a game. Yeah, game is the best. Yeah, and, and it's not like there's something you that. can look at. It, you know, like an AI 
for a human, you, there's like a person there and you can read off their face and their emotion, like there's an right. actor and there's so much bandwidth there. But for an AI or for something like a, uh, a characterized, like an anthropomorphic landscape or something where there's this character that doesn't have a human form that may not even have a visible form like Durandal, uh, how are you going to express that in film? You'd have to, you'd have to give it an avatar. But right. the whole point is that it's not an it's not something you can make an avatar of. Right. If it was a movie, you would have to have you can't just have moviegoers read the screen. That's horrible. Um George Lucas. <laughs> <laughs> it, you have you would have to have an actor come in and perform those lines, and in doing so, they would nail down things that are deliberately made ambiguous by the text only delivery yeah also i mean there's a lot of things that could only be a video game but that aren't characters like minecraft can only be a video game right yeah yeah exactly <laughs> what is the book version of minecraft like it's not as it's just like Dig a block, place a block, dig a block, place a block. That's you're not gonna read that. No, you could add a story and make a story about a character in a Minecraft world, but you would have to get very, very, very far from Minecraft to make that work. Yeah, and the whole experience of Minecraft as a a place for expression and alteration of the world is totally altered by nailing it down to a specific expression and a specific alteration. Yeah. It's like everybody's playing on the same seed and we can only build prefab buildings. <laughs> right. Yeah, it suddenly is loses so much of what makes it Minecraft. That is an interesting thing. I mean, you could argue almost everything Almost everything that's really good is probably also really bound to a particular medium. Like, they could almost be a measure of how good a piece of art is, is how, how intertwined it is with its specific medium. So that right. if you translated it elsewhere, it would no longer be that piece of art, or it would no longer, it would lose whatever makes it spe interesting. Yeah, yeah. Michelangelo's David would be a terrible video game. <laughs> right. So, I'm willing to bet you haven't played any games this week. Yeah, I've been gone. But uh, in, in order to prepare for the show, I did watch some advertisements for games on Steam when I started Steam Up. Such is our life. I, I've been kind of in a very similar spot lately. I've been trying to finish my Jedi Fallen Order. So that even though I am soaking in video game culture... You know, some weeks I just don't have anything to say right now because, you know, oh, I'm in the middle of a big writing project or something crazy like that. So what have you taken in and what do you think of it? Well, the one of the things that came up in my, uh, in the, what is it, the discovery queue, I guess they call it now, is Littlewood, which um, looked a lot like Stardew Valley, I guess, or, or it has that same kind of pixel art -y thing. It's a little more simple. It reminded me mostly of... Uh, of Pokemon, like the little towns in Pokemon. Uh, my wife, ha I just realized, I did not recognize the title, but now that you're describing it, I realize this is what my wife has been playing all week. Well, I say all week. She's been working all week. But in her few precious hours of downtime, she's been playing this game. And, I mean, I'll take that as an endorsement. Yeah, yeah. It 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 seems like it's a lot like Stardew Valley or, or something like that. Uh, very minimalist, um, and then it's got a little bit of a terrain editor. It looked like a like a map editor for Stardew Valley or something, like a, a really slow, inconvenient map editor where you have to like earn all the pieces. But still, very interesting. Yeah, it's very cute. I I don't know if I would play it, but it was like, wow, that's that's cool. Um, another thing that I looked at was Grounded, and just on its face, it's like, okay, it's like a Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, I don't know. Our whole audience is probably too young for that reference, but, uh, you know, all these little tiny people 
running around the backyard, like building stuff and things. And I was like, that's kind of neat. And so I watched the trailer and the trailer is just ace. Like it's, it's, it opens with, if you want to play the biggest game of the season, then wait for Cyberpunk. <laughs> that's adorable. And uh, so, yeah, it just keeps doing that where it's like, it, it sets up this, you know, it sets up the thing and then it subverts the thing at the last minute. And it's like, wow, this this is this is a really spot on. So I don't know if the game's any fun or not, but the trailer is definitely worth a watch. All right. I, you know what? I will I will link it. I will embed it in the show notes for anybody that wants to see this trailer. I just hit play on it while you were talking and it made me laugh. So, yeah. And then, uh, I mean, yeah. the last thing I, I mean, not while you were ahead. talking, not where you were talking. I definitely was listening to you while you were talking, but like in in the spaces between the words, I watched this trailer. <laughs> so, so the last thing that uh, that I wanted to mention, there were a bunch of game trailers, and a lot of them were just like, oh, I see what this game is about. It's not for me, but that's fine. Um, but then something that I I watched that I wasn't sure who it was for was Fantasy Star Online Two. Uh, and I played Fantasy Star Online, the original, on the GameCube, I think? Uh, a little bit. I didn't play very much. My brothers played it more. But it was like a an MMO kind of thing. You'd run around, there was a station, and you'd buy die grinders and upgrade your equipment. And I don't know. It, I never really got into it. But I was like, okay, I'm familiar with the, with the uh, you know, the, the whole top level view. And it's an MMO, and it's free to play, and you run around, and probably they're selling cosmetics or something. And uh, so I started watching this trailer, and it's like, it got some Gundams or something, and then there's a magic portal with a battleship comes out of it, and it's got the main cannons, but then it like elevates them way high, and it starts shooting at the Gundams who are flying down from the sky, and then like a bunch of World War Two airplanes take off from this World War One battleship and are like flying up into the air to attack the Gundams and they're and they drop their weapons and I don't and then the whole it like it turns the sea into ice and then all the pilots get out of their Gundams and they're gonna like fight the ice lock battleship I guess question mark what the what's going on who is this game for well I played it so let me talk about that. Oh no! Oh, Seamus, you betrayed us all! Okay, here's the thing. I have a weakness for robot suits. I love people in robot suits. Like, I love Iron Man. I love the idea of Anthem, even though the game itself is torment with eternal loading screens between, between absolutely tepid gameplay. Just flying around in... What are they called? Lancer? Lances? Lan something. Javelins. Javelins. Flying around in your javelin in Anthem is pretty dang cool. Like, oh, this feels so good. I just love people flying around in robot suits. And Fantasy Star Online, I knew, I knew from the Penny Arcade comics back in the day that it was about people in robot suits. Um, in I, I like the big impractical robot suits, right? Where it's like, is this a Gundam or a suit? That blurred line where it's like, well, do you need to be in there? <laughs> right, right. This thing's got its own AI. It's self-propelled. Like, why is there a person inside? But there is, and it's important that there is for right. some reason. It's like, right. I really like it. So I knew that that's what... Fantasy Star Online 2 was, but then I watched that same trailer and I was like, I know this is a game about having a robot suit. So what is all of this crap that has nothing to do with being in a robot suit and fighting monsters and, I don't know, dragons, demons, other robot suits, what, whatever you got, I'm here for it. But then the trailer just goes on and on and on. It's showing all this abstract stuff. And I'm like, this is a terrible trailer. You haven't shown me any gameplay or anything that hints at the genre or style. This is just like a highlight reel of like some C-tier anime, right? <laughs> right. Like that one anime that came out in the early aughts that everybody's forgotten about. That's what the trailer felt like. 
Yeah, it was just like gratuitous World War II Gundam stuff. So I played the game, got my ro I downloaded the absolutely ridiculously huge download, created the account, you know, signed in. Is this like then, a five gigabyte download or like a fifty gigabyte download? It is seventy five gigabytes. Oh wow! Yeah, I should. In fact, I should probably uninstall it. But maybe I'm skipping a spoiler. I'm not still playing it. <laughs> I got into the game and I'm like, okay, pick your character, and it's like really only one of the characters seems to have a robot suit. And then I was like, all right, I'll, I'll, okay, just one of the character clad. And then I realized, oh, I can change my outfit and just anybody can put on something that looks like a robot suit. I felt like I missed the memo going into the game. Like, I didn't know what I was picking. I just want a robot suit. And it's like, what kind of character class do you want to make? And I'm like, well, that person's just in a regular suit. I don't want to play that person. But I think all of these people could go in robot suits. You just have to change their outfit. But whatever, I get through into the game and it suddenly drops me into like what feels like a free-to-play anime game. I'm not exaggerating. Like a character comes up and it's just this generic anime guy and he starts talking to me about why I'm here and who I am and oh, it's our big day and are you ready for the big test? We're going to have our combat test today and I'm like, click, click. Click, yeah, 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 the bullshit. Okay, this, is, this isn't this is my first MMO, kid. Just fuck off. Like, let's play this game. <laughs> all right, all right, well, it's time to talk to the computer. Oh, fuck, we're going to go talk to the computer lady now. All right, oh, you're going to have to walk over there. All right, we'll walk over there. I mean, this just went on and on and on. And then finally, the, you know, he's like, all right, here's the target, you know, attack it. And I'm like, fine, 20 minutes into this. It's not 20 minutes, but whatever. I'm, I'm way into this. It's finally time to hit some buttons and blow something up. And I do that, and then the computer lady shows up and starts talking, and somebody else shows up and starts talking. I'm like, why is there so much friggin' story in this MMO about being a robot suit? And I kept waiting for, okay, okay, we're done, okay. No, you, there's more guys that, no, here's another person joining our party. Why does this suddenly feel like Final Fantasy with people showing up and telling me about themselves and characters talking to each other? And I'm like, what kind of MMO is this? <laughs> this is what the advantages of an MMO is you generally don't have to sit through somebody's excruciating, excruciatingly cringy and poorly translated wannabe anime you know it's just here <laughs> right some mechanics go to town and i got through it with that whole intro thing and then it teleported me back to wherever i came from and i'm just clicking furiously like i'm like i should be reading this and then i'd stop and read it and i'm like oh this is awful no i can't read it i can't read it it's too bad <laughs> It's just like five sentences to tell me something super to try and integrate. You know, here it's trying to explain. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know, it's trying to integrate the the game tutorial with the the canon of this whole narrative and the the motivations right. of the characters that are talking to you. Right, or it's trying to explain game mechanics to me, and instead of saying drink a health potion, it's like, you know, got some crazy name for it, and some crazy way of accessing it, and teaching me how to menu, and after I got through it, I'm like, alright, well, at least I'm out of the tutorial now, and he's like, go talk to the robot lady now, and I'm like, Alt F4. <laughs> but, but they have the robot suits! I know, I know, I was so there for the robot suit, and it was just, I don't even think I lasted an hour with the game. I just couldn't, it wouldn't let me play, it was unplayable. It was unplayable in the sense that, that it would not let me play it. It just wanted to talk to me about some convoluted stuff I didn't care about. Oh man, so so hang on. So it, it wasn't unplayable because it wouldn't run. It was unplayable because it wouldn't stop running. Right? <laughs> right? Oh, like, imagine firing up World of Warcraft and you get there and you click on the first 
quest giver and they're trying to explain using in-world terms what your hot bar is and how to put new spells on it. <laughs> it's like these levels of convoluted stupidity trying to use this obvious gameplay abstraction and trying to explain it within the lore when you do not care about any of the lore and you just want the gameplay. Right, and you ha so you didn't even get to the part where you go and kill like wolves for wolf pelts. Oh no, you I did get to that, and we got to fight a boss, but it was so noisy, and they you know they're the the idiots are like behind me talking to each other about we need to hold out for until the something the robot like until somebody on the ship can, this boss is too strong for us but we just need to hold it off and meanwhile on the other side of the screen it's giving me prompts for like what buttons i'm supposed to be pushing and the, just everything is so cluttered and i'm like what is it that i need to be doing right now what's important for me to advance what do you want from me game and it's just all this chatter and so I did get to fight things, but like at one point I got knocked down, I got KO'd. And then immediately one of my tutorial buddies rezzed me and I couldn't tell, did I make a mistake or was that scripted? I'm pretty sure I made a mistake. I ran right up to a monster and it hit me. And I'm like, but what was, you know, it never gave me a coherent set of lessons and there's so much stuff going on. It's too distracting. I'm not. I'm going through this tutorial, but not learning anything from it, because it's just throwing so much stuff. Here's the thing. I'm clicking through the incredibly verbose dialogue, and then I don't know what I need to do. But if I listened to all the dialogue, because you know, in these five lines of dialogue, there's this tiny nugget of information that I need. You know, then I'm, yeah, maybe I'm it's like a hidden stuff. object game only in text. Right. <laughs> right. And so some of this confusion was certainly my fault, but it's my fault because I wasn't willing to sit through this terrible schlock to play, you know, what is, you know, it's, I'm to the point now where I hear an MMO is grindy and I'm like, oh, thank God, I got to try this. Good. Get me on that treadmill. Don't talk to me. The last thing I want is somebody trying to tell me a story. <laughs> in tiny text boxes in the middle of you just trying to interact with your giant robot suit. Well, the, there's the tiny text boxes. That's a Western convention. When you get these, e this is definitely, you know, like Japanese or Korean or, you know, some Eastern developer. And their convention, because of the way, you know, their, their, their language works, where they've got entire words in, embodied in one symbol. Their text boxes are very short. You know, every sentence gets its own pop-up kind of thing. Okay. So you do a lot of clicking. It's not like Mass Effect where you get it a paragraph at a time. This is you get it a sentence at a time. So there's a lot of clicking to plow through. So what's the... Okay, so you didn't like it, and it doesn't sound like I would like it, but like, what's the takeaway here? How do these, how do these people make their money making this game? It's... Oh, it's got to be cosmetics. There was ever just from the moment I was creating my character, they were like, oh, you can buy some outfits if you don't like the default outfits, which there was only one robot. There weren't any of them that really looked like the robot suits in the promotional materials, like somebody encased in a great big fancy suit. These are all look like outfits that just have some robot parts bolted on, or maybe this is just a very square suit. It's hard to tell. So I knew it wanted me to buy the outfits, but I would have done it. I mean, I was there. I had a little money. I was willing to drop into the game if it was willing to let me have a good time. I kind of like the idea of playing an MMO with a controller. I got to sit back and just use my Xbox controller. That felt pretty... I mean, it would have felt pretty good if I'd been able to play for more than five <laughs> seconds at a time. Could have felt good. Right, it was like, oh, you, here's a dodge button. It, did, it didn't tell me my dodge button, or it told me within dialogue. Because I was like... Yeah, yeah. It's you'll find dodge. that the enemies here are so comp competitive that you'll need to evade them in some way. Perhaps the button on your controller, which you're using <laughs> inside of your HUD, will enable you to, to perform this task with efficiency and grace. 
<laughs> right? You just click, click, click. Oh, I missed something important there. Like it was a uh, right trigger for dodge, which what the hell kind of control scheme is that? But a uh, right trigger, normally an attacking, an aggressive attacking button. Use, I mean, that is, I've never seen that in a control scheme, but it's, uh, you know, it's an MMO. They, they have more complicated systems and systems with different priorities. That might make sense, you know, once you learn all the controls for the game. But I didn't see what the button was. I had to pause the game and then realize, oh, it's an MMO. I can't pause the game. So I'm there, like, <laughs> no. just parked a little way from the battle scrolling through the the key bindings trying to because the, the prompt is like you're gonna need to dodge you're gonna need to dodge don't forget to dodge and i'm like yeah it would be great if i knew what the button was and trying to figure it out and oh, why would you do this why would you put all the i mean think about how much money how think about how expensive it was to ruin this Oh yeah, they just shoveled piles of cash at making this an obtuse and inscrutable experience. Right, and just unpleasant and poorly paced. And I would have had a good time if you just like let me just get rid of all the other guys and let me be, you know, just go through and kill the monsters, you know, and just put the prompt up on the screen as a little pop-up, like, you know, every so, other game. So this is trying to be like a, a high school shoujin anime kind of thing, where you've got, like, all your buddies, and you're going to take the test, and, you like, you've got to wait for the teacher to show up and unlock the room. Well, probably. I mean, keep in mind, I skipped a lot. <laughs> but that's what it <laughs> felt like. That was the vibe I was getting. I mean, I don't know. Maybe he adopted me as his son, or maybe, maybe he was my son. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he's my boyfriend. I don't know. I don't know. It was if you buy the right he's... outfit, I'll bet he would be. <laughs> right. I mean, he seemed enthused to be there. Actually, the thing oh, that man. annoyed me is that he was complaining a lot. So that was like really grating. And like, if this is an anime, of course you want that. You want to have this person with this personality. Oh, this is the guy that complains all the time and is a bit of a coward. But in the context of an MMO, you have a tutorial buddy that doesn't want to be there? It's like, that is the most annoying thing in the world. Right, yeah, you don't want to be modeling that behavior for the player right at the start. <clears throat> right. And just creates so much extraneous, like, oh no, a big monster shows up, and before I can fight it, I get to listen to him bitch about it. <laughs> it's just so dissonant. Oh, Whoa, I man. spent way more time on that. I mean, really, this was only like 45 minutes or something. I made more of a big deal of this. And I even suspect that once I plowed through all that crap, I might actually really like the game. But the intro was just so endlessly irritating. I alt F forward. Something else I saw pop up on the um, on the advertisement thing was Imperion Galactic Survival, and I was like, "Wow, that looks really cool!" But I don't think I'm going to be into it, and so I just kind of skipped right by it. it. Do you know anything about that? You are a wiser man than me. I envy your wisdom. Uh, I was. You played that enough. one too. Yes, I was foolish enough. To go and I'm like, all right, a survival crafting game. All right, that 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 doesn't have a good reputation these days. Survival crafting is super played out. But I'm like, I looked at the comments and this was like, oh man, this will fix your No Man's Sky blues. This is what No Man's Sky should have been. Hmm. And so I'm like, great. Um, off to a rough start. The game took two solid minutes to launch. Just like just No Man's loading. Sky. Right, no. So, like, when you launch No Man's Sky for the first time, it does this thing with shaders where it needs to think about it for two or three minutes. And it's super horrible. But once it does that, the next time you start it, it's more like a normal video game where it's, like, still a bit long, like 20, 30 seconds, but not outrageous as in spanning several minutes. This game took a few minutes to pop up. And then... And then I got, you know, I had to create a game. And it was the same problem as Fantasy Star Online 2. 
I get in there and I'm like, okay, teach me these mechanics. I am here for a mechanically driven experience, survival crafting. And it's like, oh no, I found myself on an alien world. I wonder what I should be doing. And then it's like, oh, I should connect to my computer lady. And I'm like, another freaking computer lady. And so you do, and you oh, you turn on the computer, and she starts talking to you, and it's all text boxes. So it's like, unlike Fantasy Star Online, they didn't waste a lot of money making this awful. <laughs> so I'm clicking for, you know, okay, just what are the game? I don't even know if I'm I'm down for your gameplay yet. I don't care about context. I didn't need any context when I played Minecraft. I didn't need to land in Minecraft and have my character go. Well, I seem to find myself in a randomly generated wilderness. I should look for ways to survive. Maybe punching down a tree would help. Yeah, and Minecraft you know, just... might have been a more successful game, I think, if, if you yes. had had that. I mean, imagine how successful it would be if there was a, a helper that would be like, Look! Listen! Look! Listen! <laughs> Mega Man! Mega Man! <laughs> Yeah, so Imperion, so it had me walk. Oh, I need to, okay, there's a beacon. I found a beacon in the distance. And I see it gives me a waypoint one kilometer away. And I'm like, well, this is a long, boring hike. I mean, walking a kilometer, you, you're moving at human sprinting speed, so it's not bad. But I'm like, I, I still don't know what, like, the game, I don't have any tools, I don't have anything to do. Like, what am I supposed to be doing here? I get to this thing and click through the dialogue, and I forget what the exact wording was, but the guy, but my character's like, I should, I, it, I basically get redirected to another waypoint, and this one is two kilometers away. So, your reward for walking a kilometer is that you get to walk two kilometers. And I'm like, but you didn't. You didn't give me anything for walking this kilometer. It was just teaching me how to find a waypoint and click on a thing. You could have done that by having me cross the room. Why did I have to walk? Or, and what am I getting out of this tutorial? Like, can't you speed this up? Why do I need to spend five minutes hiking across the wilderness? What, what should I be doing? What's my goal? Oh, here I'm passing some scrap. Should I be harvesting that? Should I be doing something with that? What do I need? What What are my immediate needs that is not walking across the fucking landscape? <laughs> it's a walking simulator. Oh, wait, no, it's supposed to be a survival crafting game. And then I kind of... Uh, I, I wanted to pause the game. So I hit escape and it brings up the menu, but I can see the game's still running. You know, the wind is still blowing in the trees, stuff is still animated. And like... Oh, this game's this game you can play for with friends, so it just keeps running, so you can't pause. Ugh. Now that's bad, but when you can now, I mean, it's survival crafting, and I I knew from looking at the menus that it had food, so logically you you get hungry in this game, so you don't want to walk away and leave it running, you know. Well. And the day-night cycle, you don't want to leave that going, you know, and they're like, oh, I'll just walk away from the game to go make dinner, and the sun will go down, and I'll get eaten by, you know, a Gru or whatever. Like, I'm, yeah, I'm worried. One can only problem. hope. Right? But then I'm like, wait a minute. So, so I guess you're supposed to shut the game down, but wait, it takes two minutes to launch the game. And the, at that moment, I realized, okay, huge startup times. Plus, you can't pause. Alt F4, refund. So, I had a terrible luck with games this week. Man, that's too bad. It, it, it looked really cool. Yeah, yeah, and I was I was down there for, hey, like, I, it showed you building your own spaceship. And it, that was one of my frustrations. It's like, it looked like a combination between No Man's Sky and Space Engineers. And I'm like, I am here for that. And then the tutorial was odd and frustrating, and you can't pause it, and it was really slow. And I, I had stability problems. It like was really didn't want to start, and I had to really fresh fuss with it. And the graphics settings didn't make any sense, and it didn't want to run in a proper window size. And there was a bunch of technology problems too. So it wasn't just that the oh, intro man. was bad. And that's yeah. that's even more damning. I was thinking like you start up the first time and then you quit. But if you start it multiple times, you really know that it does take like two minutes every time. 
Well, it took, it was crash on startup, crash on startup, crash on startup, crash on startup, then take two minutes to launch. So maybe <sighs> if I tried again, it would have been fast, but I was like, no, I can't, no, this is, this is, I am not signing up for this. <laughs> this is just too rough. And you know, I don't know how it happened when I went down and read all the reviews before buying it, they were all positive and they were all like, this is what No Man's Sky should have been. When after, after I started having problems, I went to the forums and it was like, this game should not be released. You know, this game should have stayed in early access. This is not ready for general release. This is not ready for 1.0, which it had just gone. It, this was the official release. Um, oh, no. th this is not ready to leave early access. This is way too soon. Lots of stability. And I'm like, why do we have this huge disparity from what reviews are saying and what people are saying on the forum? The f if I checked the forums, I would have realized, oh, this needs more time to bake. I need to, I need to give this game <laughs> some more time. Uh, you know, come back in six wow, months. Wow, so and see it if it's really better. is just like Snowman Sky, right? Are they procedurally generated planets, though? Uh, ostensibly, yeah. I mean, I had to. It gives you a chance to enter a seed. I mean, it was just like this real pale green. That, that's another thing. The terrain was like really super boring. The whole thing looked like an asset flip. Like there was nothing fantastical about it. Um, it was just really flat, like lighting. The game ran in Unity. And I don't know why. I don't know why. Like, at one in seven Unity games have these horrendous load times. I, you know, I did Proc Gen. You saw my Minecraft thing, and that started yeah. almost instantly. Um, even though it was generating, you know, a giant world, giant yeah. block world, megabytes and megabytes of data. Right, and you would just generate that, and you can read. You could open up the console and regenerate it, and it was no big deal, and there was nothing slow about it. But every once in a while, and I think it's if you use Unity's asset loading systems that you wind up with just these absolutely excruciating load times. And I think, you know, I am not even sure this is the developer's fault. I think this is the developer trusting Unity's load system, which is weird as hell. <laughs> you have to you have to bypass all the conveniences that they built into the engine in order for the engine to be any use at all. Right, I guess. I don't know. I've never done an asset, you know, because I always do proc gen stuff, and proc gen stuff. The irony being that's this the asset loading stuff is the stuff that's really well documented online, and proc gen it's very hard to find the secrets of how to do proc gen in Unity. It's like they don't want you to do it. It's like, oh, these are secret techniques only for advanced programmers. You might have to worry about vertexes. <laughs> but also super fast. Right. It's 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 darn good. Um, yeah, like I said, I made a Minecraft world and it generated a lot of stuff very quickly and I was very happy with its performance. But, um, yeah, this game was excruciating. <laughs> In its load times, and it just makes me sad. All right, I think I spent too much time on those last two topics, but I've got one mailbag here that I want to answer, and then we'll wrap up. Dear Diecast, Seamus, I know you voiced your disdain for Twitter a few times and have since deleted your account, but if you considered using it exclusively for announcing new posts on your blog, who knows, it might generate some additional traffic. Kind regards, Eric. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Um, you're probably right. I probably am mo missing out on some traffic by not having Twitter. But I am just so glad to not have that platform to worry about. It, incidentally, Less stress. I talk, yeah, I talked about this. I mean, I know I talked about this last week. But last week, I was also on another podcast. Um, the A. Steve podcast with Chris. And we talked about this at length. So if you're curious about this topic and want to hear us discuss Twitter at length, like I think for 40 minutes we talked about Twitter, um, I will have a link to that in the show notes. But yeah, I'm just glad to not be participating. Because of the stress, like you said, Paul, 
because Twitter does seem to know how to, if anybody you follow ever gets political, then, then Twitter will begin trying to tease out your tribal affiliations so that it can find things to infuriate you with. I mean, I tried multiple times. I went during the 2016 election, I think, I went on a, not during the election, but in the run-up, I went on a massive purge and just everybody that talked politics, just, oh, you're, you're, link, you're, you're angry and linking to politics, unfollow. And you no, know, it was before that. There was some, there was some hot time before that. And some time when politics was a hot button issue. I, I don't know what yeah, you're talking there about. Was some, yeah, I can't remember either. It was some weird brief moment in history, but it was just, I started I decided, okay, I've fallen into this algorithm's trap. I need to clean it up. If I clean up, clean out all my politically um, active people, then Twitter will stop thinking that I'm here for that sort of content. And it'll realize I'm just here to network with game journos and, you know, industry leaders and things like that. And I tried cleaning it out, and Twitter would not stop. Just every once in a while, just like something that I had nothing to do with anything I was doing, but was super controversial. And it would find it, and it would show it to me, and I'd get mad. I mean, I'd fall for it. I'd click through, scroll through, get mad at a bunch of people, realize, and, you know, don't post mad and walk away from it, but just keep being irritated and... How stupid some people... You know how those people are, Paul. Those really oh, stupid yeah, yeah. people. Man, those people yeah, with the, those The same opinions. thing happens to me on Facebook. Like, I've got... I have a, a, a small business where I do 3D models. And so on Facebook, I have a site there, or like a little page where people can leave reviews. And it's really convenient because if I put reviews up on my own website, like, well, I could have just made those up. But if it's on Facebook, then at least it's verified. You know, these are real people that have real accounts. And, you know makes it more genuine. Um, right. And so occasionally I'll go on Facebook to do something and and like Facebook's like, hey, here's all this drama. Don't you want to be drawn into this drama? And I'm like, I really don't, but oh no. And so then I like close Facebook and then I'm like, wait a minute. I was on there for a reason. I was trying to accomplish right? something. <laughs> right? I had that happen so many times on Twitter. Go on there for something like, oh, I need to look up this link, or somebody linked to this game yesterday, I want to look that up, or what did they say about it? And then you get sidetracked into trauma, realize it's bad for your mental health, close it, and then realize, oh, I just, this platform just distracted me from my work. <laughs> right? And the other, the other fear I have of Twitter that Chris and I talked about is the fear of when you get mad and Twitter pushes your buttons, you want to say something. And there's always... Chris and I talked about the problem of all of these intelligent people that I respect getting into ridiculous, petty, childish slap fights on Twitter. Like, here's somebody I think is a really intelligent person. I could have a great conversation with them, but they look like a howling idiot when they get on Twitter. And just like insulting another person I would otherwise respect, but is acting like a jackass on Twitter. And both of them are just, they seem like children. When, if they were communicating in any other medium, they would be more measured, they would spend more time weighing their words, they would have more, longer, more coherent thought, but instead it's the, the classic tweet storm format, the, the stream of conscious, the stream of consciousness mixed with adrenaline anger. Yeah. Well, and it's, I don't know if we want to get drawn into this. We're already getting distracted by Twitter, Seamus. We're not even on the platform. Right? Right. So that's, that's why I'm not going to go back is because there's always that once you do that, once you get mad and post angry, that's up there. People know you said it. If you said something really dumb, that's screenshotted. That's going to follow you. And my strength is, you know, sitting there and thinking about what I'm going to say and what I really think and listening carefully and then getting a response. Not doing this wild shoot from the hip, talk when you're angry, drown the other. So 
it's all downside. It's all risk. I could the only thing I could do with Twitter is shoot myself in the foot. So I understand it has value as a promotional tool, but I don't dare use it for mental health and for pretending that I'm not a horrible human being. This pretense that we are all participating <laughs> maintaining in maintaining the facade of civility. Right. Right. It's very important that we that we all wear that that mask and not just like speak unfiltered. Yeah. Well, that's what family's for, right? Right. I don't wear my mask around them. They know what an asshole I am. But they're stuck with me. Thanks for editing the episode, by the way, Isaac. <laughs> All right. That's the show, everybody. There are a couple more mailbags here we didn't get to. I'm sorry about that. We will get to them next week. If you've got a question you want to throw into our hole of questions that never get answered, um, the email is diecast at shamesyoung.com. Thanks for listening, everybody. Say goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Paul. We thought we were going to run short, but it was a long show after all. It's I blame a long you. show after all. It's a long show after all. It's a long show after all. It's a long, 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 long show.